Hello and welcome to the 2021 Genes in Space finalist Launchpad. I am delighted you decided to join us here today. My name is Dr. Katie Martin. I'm the program lead for Genes in Space, and I'm going to be hosting the Launchpad over the next couple days. Um, we are going to be choosing our 2021 winner live at the Launchpad, and you are invited to join us every step of the way. Uh, I'm so uh, delighted you decided to turn out to join us. Um, for the purposes of kicking off today, though, I wanted to start by introducing you to our program and setting the stage for what you're about to see over the next couple days. So Genes in Space, if you're not already familiar with us, um, we're an ideas competition. We challenge students in middle and high school all throughout the US uh, to propose biology experiments they'd like to see done in space. And then we launch one winning experiment to the International Space Station each year where it's carried out by astronauts. Our 2021 competition began back in January when we opened up our application. Um, our application is free for any student in the US to submit. Um, and as you can imagine, we receive a wide range of bright and brilliant and wild ideas. Uh, and it is really hard to select just one winner from the pool of outstanding ideas we receive. And so we don't do it all in one step. This year we received 630 applications um, and we started by naming 30 semifinalists. We challenged these semifinalists to, pr uh, to produce one minute video pitches explaining why we should launch their experiment to space. And then from those 30 semifinalists, we selected five finalists who are in contention to launch their experiments to the ISS next year. Those are the students you see pictured here on the slide. Now, at the beginning of the summer, we paired each finalist team with a mentor. Our mentors are really wonderful, dedicated scientists operating out of our local area of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and they're asked to support our finalist teams in refining their idea, improving their proposal, and preparing an oral presentation based on their idea. Now, in an ordinary year, we fly our finalists and their mentors to the ISS Research and Development Conference, where our finalists present their ideas to our panel of judges. And then at the conclusion of the conference, our judges announce which uh, student will be launching their experiment to space, which usually happens the following year. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, we've had to kind of pivot our model. And now we're holding our Genes in Space finals round online at our finalist launch pad. So that's the event that you're tuning into this week. Uh, and today we're kicking off the launch pad. And the idea behind our kickoff program today is to get you all as excited about launching awesome biology experiments to space as we all are. So we've assembled a panel of scientists who are gonna share their exciting work with you and kind of get you on the space biology band, band when, bandwagon along with us. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to announce, uh, to introduce our first speaker today. Christoph Mesquita was a senior at Stuyvesant High School in New York City when he won Genes in Space 2020 at last year's finalist launch pad. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of a shutdown, he dreamed up a really exciting idea that none of us had ever really considered before. He wanted to know more about the impact of microgravity on drug metabolism. Um, over the past year, he's been working hard to prepare this experiment for launch along with the help of his mentors. And that exciting day is almost here. On August 10th, we are going to be launching his project out of Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. Now, Christoph is really busy not just preparing his project for launch, but also graduating high school, um, completing a summer internship in aerospace engineering, and preparing to start college at MIT this fall. But um, we're very grateful he took time out of his busy schedule to join us here at the launch pad and share a bit about his exciting project with us. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Christoph Mesquita back to our launch pad. Welcome, Christoph. Thank you, Dr. Martin. And uh, I'll just go ahead and share my slides. All right, so good morning, everyone. I am so delighted and honored to be back here again at the launch pad today. I'm going to tell you all more about how my experiment has evolved with the amazing help of the Genes and Space team over the past year. So this is analyzing astronaut drug metabolism through gene expression. But before I dive into the details of the study, I think it's appropriate to start with a little bit about my journey here. So as Dr. Martin mentioned, my name is Christoph Mesquita. It was just a few weeks ago that I wrapped up an amazing four years at Stuyvesant High School. Um, one of the finalists is in the neighborhood actually, um, which is this red circle just north of the World Trade Center. Uh, the city may not be the best for stargazing, but at the very least, I've still been able to explore my love for space flight and astronautics through the Genes in Space program. So what a summer it has been. I've been able to step into the shoes of an astronaut, turn my bedroom into a science lab in this middle picture over here, 
and develop friendships with some of the most incredible scientists and mentors I've ever met at Boeing, at Mini PCR, at MIT, and Harvard. But I like to say that although Genes in Space 8, the experiment uh, began last summer, it really has its roots a few decades earlier, and that was during the Apollo missions. So what do we know Apollo for? Uh, we know Apollo for landing the first man on the moon, maybe for launching the Saturn V rocket. One of the lesser known yet really important achievements of that era was also enduring a common cold in space. So this was all the way back in 1968. Within 10 days of the launch of Apollo 7, the crew had burned through all of its decongestants. It had Kleenex tissues stuffed everywhere throughout the cabin. And even in a sickness induced fit of irritability had even disobeyed instructions from mission control. Remember, this was all from just a common cold. NASA had simply never seen something like this before. So needless to say, that crew of Apollo 7 never ended up flying again. But at the very least, their legacy did leave us with a really important question. And that's, do the therapeutic strategies that we employ on Earth work equally effectively in space? And on the surface, it didn't look like it. But if we wanted to take a more, uh, uh, like a more technical standpoint, well, we could look at the data. Now, I'll admit the data is limited, and it still is largely subjective. But there are a couple things we do know. First of all, across 79 shuttle missions in the 20th century and a little bit in the 21st century, about one in five medication uses were perceived as not fully effective. Now that might strike you as pretty bad already, but there is also more recent data as well. If we look on the ISS, we see that about 40% of the uses of anti-inflammatory anti drugs and huge portions across the board where efficacy just isn't reported or clearly isn't up to par compared to the standards we have on Earth. So what does this mean? Well, you might consider on the most benign end of the spectrum, it means that if you have a headache and you take a drug for that, well, a headache might persist a little longer. If you have sleep problems and you take a drug to help you with that, then sleep might be a little harder to come by. Now, that's not a great diagnosis already for astronauts who are working around the clock on experiments, one of which could be yours, and otherwise doing spacewalks and other really rigorous activities. And where making one error can have really huge consequences. But that's just the benign end. If you consider the other end of the spectrum, astronauts are also no stranger to more severe ailments as well. We've seen the beginnings of kidney stones. We've seen urinary tract infections. We've seen even a severe blood clot just last year in space. And every single time we can chalk it up to luck that astronauts didn't have to make an emergency return to Earth. It could be resolved easily on the space station. But that doesn't change the reality that on the ISS and certainly on a future long duration mission to Mars or some other planet, we may not be pharmacologically equipped to handle a real medical emergency. Now, if we really wanted to get to the heart of what might be causing these anomalies, there's a pretty good chance it has something to do with the liver. Um, and you probably know the liver better as the body's primary site of drug metabolism. So just for a brief overview of what's going on in here, deep inside the liver's tissues, proteins are hard at work taking the active elements of any drug we ingest and turning them into inactive ones, the inactive products. Uh, this is just a high level overview of metabolism. It just readies the drug for elimination from the body. Now, seeing how proteins are what facilitates tr this transition, they're the middle point over here. It's easy to imagine that if something were to be disrupted in this middle, somehow the production of these proteins were to change, then that can have a pretty dramatic impact on the therapeutic effects of the drug that they metabolize. The therapeutic effects emerge from this transition through this chain. But if we wanted to see this more clearly, I think I'll copy this diagram over and add a new graph and relate two variables of interest. The first being protein activity and the second one being drug effect. So if we consider a normal concentration of proteins, what happens here? Well, the drug gets cleared efficiently and it hits the therapeutic window. So this is this bar being hit over here. This is what happens when you, a drug you take is effective. It simply achieves some target concentration in the body. So in other words, the headache you had is relieved the inflammation you had is reduced, you stop having an allergic reaction because the drug is now effective. We consider this within the therapeutic range. But what happens in some alternate scenario? You consider some factor, maybe stress, maybe poor diet, cause con protein concentrations to fall in the liver, so at the bottom over here. Well, then the logical outcome here is that the metabolism of medicine is actually slowed because there are less workers around to perform the task of breaking it down. So effectively, the drug will stay active in the body for longer and its, its effects will be greater than what you may have anticipated when you took it. So it exceeds the therapeutic range, it's unsafe. So in severe cases, rather than cure the ailment, this could trigger a rash, it could damage the kidney, it could decrease the number of white blood cells. In general, it could cause some adverse reaction that you weren't expecting when you first took the drug. And so I think it's very easy to think about the third scenario over here. And I think this one is actually the most relevant in our study, high protein concentration. 
So looking at the pattern so far, it's pretty clear that in this case, the drug you take tends to be broken down way too fast. It gets cleared into its inactive metabolites before it can really do its job. And so once again, if we were to consider the, the macroscopic effects, the headache persists, your nose is still stuffy, you still can't get any sleep because the drug is getting cleared too fast. It can't do anything much in the body. It fails to reach that therapeutic range I was talking about, those green lines, it's ineffective. So if we wanna bring it back to space here, this lack of drug efficacy as detailed, especially in this third pattern, is pretty similar to what astronauts have been describing as happening on the space shuttle and the ISS. And so what Genes in Space 8, my experiment is will aim to do is lay the groundwork to find out whether all of this I've described, this interplay between proteins and drug activity is the reason. Whether variations in protein concentration in the liver in space as a result of factors like microgravity or altered diet, intense exercise, you name it, could contribute to the therapeutic anomalies that astronauts have been observing over the past a de few decades. So one quick note before I carry on with the actual experiment. Um, you probably know by now it is possible to measure protein concentrations on the ISS, but this is genes in space. So advances in technology are actually making it a lot more efficient to walk up the chain and measure the precursors of proteins instead, the genes. So you're probably familiar with DNA, which at its most basic is just a blueprint or instruction manual for making RNA. And RNA, once again, is that intermediary between DNA and proteins. And so here's the key part. Whenever we make proteins or see variations in the concentration of proteins, so these two just popped up over here, we can generally trace that back to variations in the amount of RNA. So maybe there's more RNA corresponding to more protein produced. So there seems to be somewhat of a direct correspondence here. And given that correspondence between RNA concentrations and protein concentrations, if we just measure the concentration of RNA instead of proteins, which is easier and simpler to do, they can actually tell us a lot about the state of protein production in the liver. So the information we can get out of that is largely the same. So I mentioned now that it's direct and easier to measure RNA concentration. So let me now introduce, introduce you to the tool that's really revolutionizing how we can do this so efficient, efficiently in space. And this tool actually launches to the ISS for the very first time with Genes in Space 8 this year. I'll dim the lights for this one. It is called the Genes in Space Fluorescence Viewer, though you might know it better as something of an evolution of the P51. So it's off at the moment, but if you put in the appropriate tubes and you were to flip the switch, you'd see a sensational display of the fluorescence generated by organic molecules like DNA. That might sound a little straightforward on the surface, but it actually makes genetic studies and diagnostics a lot faster and a lot more economical aboard the ISS. So I want to recap a little about what are the key benefits of the P51 or the genes in space fluorescence viewer. So first of all, we know it to be really, really fast. It takes no time at all to pop tubes from a PCR machine or some other biological assay straight into the viewer. And that means it's optimized for small scale studies or quick medical applications. Second of all, it's really accessible. There's no specialized, there's no costly, there's no resource intensive lab equipment involved. And that makes it perfect for resource limited environments like some places on earth and especially on the ISS. And finally, and I think most fun of all, the results from the fluorescence viewer are strikingly visual. So you can generate them right on the space station and you can draw conclusions, well, pretty much right away. You can see this gradient in fluorescence right away over here. And if you compare that to more standard assays or results from like procedures like qPCR, it's clear that the latter takes a lot more expertise and time and probably some form of downlinked earth to understand. So with a lot more expertise involved. So this experiment is going to be the fluorescence viewer's debut for all the reasons listed here. And finally, here are the steps of this experiment. So this is an abstract, abstracted layout. Um, I've simplified a lot over here and you're gonna notice a few simplifying assumptions first. So first of all, we're not using humans. We're actually using mice as model, model organisms instead because they're well-characterized models of drug metabolism already and they're just much more accessible to the treatments we're planning to administer. So what treatments exactly? Well, acetaminophen on the right over here. Uh, you might know acetamin acetaminophen better as Tylenol. Um, and we're choosing Tylenol or acetaminophen because its effects on the liver are understood really well in depth. And so the results we can get uh, are easily rationalized. And so for the third reason, and this ties into the third point here, we're administering acetaminophen because it's actually a stand-in for a lot of the microgravity induced changes we'd expect to see if this portion of the experiment were to be carried out in space. So you heard that right. Um, this part of the experiment, the, the administration of the drug and the collection of RNA from the liver is actually occurring on Earth, not in space. Why? Well, because this experiment, we consider it to be more of a proof of concept. So not necessarily producing a final answer on the question of drug metabolism, 
but more so just getting us information that we can use for future investigations, perhaps to be carried out entirely on the space station. So with these simplifying assumptions out of the way, we can start, start on the steps of the experiment. So one group on the left, the control group is going to remain untreated and the group on the right, the experimental group is going to receive that acetaminophen. Um, so once we do that, we're going to extract RNA, the, or a genetic material from the cells. We're gonna revert it to its more stable DNA form freeze those tubes and launch them to the ISS. So something of a freeze and fly over here. So once we're on the ISS, um, we can selectively target those DNA sequences we had in the mini PCR machine. So amplify that target DNA. And doing so means we're finally ready to put the tubes inside the genes and space fluorescence viewer and visualize the res those results. And so if you remember those pictures I was showing you earlier of tubes fluorescing in the genes and space viewer, well, as it turns out, those were already the preliminary results from a trial run of this experiment that was conducted on Earth, and in fact, in my bedroom, exactly over here. So this strip over here is a, is a strip of the actual tubes from the genes and space fluorescence viewer carried out for a particular gene in the liver. So right away, we're going to notice two things. I've isolated two tubes on the left over here. First of all, the tube with fluorescent dye is shining really brightly, and the tube with water is not shining brightly at all. This is the expected result. These are control tubes. Now, if we move over to the right over here, three tubes, uh, we're gonna see that these are the tubes that for the corresponding to the mice that didn't receive any treatment at all, but we still isolated that RNA from them and converted it into DNA. So there is genetic material inside these tubes. And if we know that, then these results make sense too. These tubes are shining a little more brightly than the water, a little less brightly than the fluorescent dye, and this is the halfway point we're expecting to see. But the significance of these results really emerge if we compare them to the tubes on the right. And so these were tubes corresponding to the mice that actually received that drug, acetaminophen, and then the genetic material was isolated. These tubes are even brighter, which means even more DNA present. And if you remember walking up all the way that chain, we can correspond that back to the fact that there was more protein produced in the livers of the mice. And that's a clear representation of the impact of administration of a drug on drug metabolism in the case of acetaminophen. So if we were to execute this aboard the ISS, it would be a powerful and a compelling proof of concept of the ability to detect changes in drug metabolism through some form of DNA analysis like that of the genes in space viewer in space. And so what do we take away from all this? So ultimately what we have here is how a long-standing problem in space travel can be probed with some cutting edge space technologies. And so if you're curious what comes next from here in the next year, maybe next couple of years, well, alongside traditional tools like the qPCR machine, we now have the genes in space viewer on the ISS. And that's set to be a mainstay of ISS biology. So enabling a lot faster diagnostics and assessments of gene expression, not just in the liver, not just in humans, but in other organs, organs or even other organisms as well, like bacteria. And as it goes for drug metabolism, well, the path forward could lead us to an imp uh, improved dosing for astronauts, for example, an in-space platform for synthesizing better medicines tailored to astronaut needs at the moment, or I think the most interesting one of all is perhaps precision medicines designed exclusively for spacefarers, the ones tailored specifically to the diseases and the types of uh, illnesses we see occurring in astronauts. And now from time to time, I still have to remind myself that the launch of this experiment and the genesis of all these fantastic results is just in two weeks. Um, so we'll be heading down to Wallops Island, Virginia on August 10th, 2021. Um, the Genes and Space team and I will be heading there to launch the, watch the launch of the NG-16 rocket to the ISS. I think it's a beautiful culmination of all the planning and all the work we've put in so far since that fateful day at the, at the launch pad last year. And so thus, when the mission to Mars or some far off planet finally arrives, I think we'll have the peace of mind in knowing that we'll be at least one step closer to being pharmacologically equipped through genes in space. So thank you. Christoph, thank you so much for returning to the launch pad to share this work with us. Um, congratulations on the upcoming launch. We are super proud to support this project. Thanks, Dr. Martin, and good luck to all the finalists too. Thanks so much. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Ali Huang is co-creator of the BioBits cell-free protein expression system. Uh, this is brand new technology that we are planning to launch to the ISS in 2022. Now you're gonna be hearing a lot about BioBits over the coming days as our 2021 finalists were encouraged to uh, incorporate this exciting new tech into their proposals. Now, Dr. Huang's uh, 
work with BioBits began when she was completing her PhD at MIT under the guidance of Dr. Jim Collins, who himself is a leader in the field of cell-free protein expression. Um, when Ellie gained experience with this new technology, she immediately grasped how it could be used to revolutionize biology teaching. For the same reasons that this technology is well-suited to launch to space, it's equally well-suited to be shipped all around the world to support biology education. Uh, Dr. Huang is now a team member at Mini PCR Bio, which is one of the sponsors that founded Genes in Space. Um, at Mini PCR, she works to introduce BioBits to teachers and students so that they can use it to learn complex biological techniques through hands-on experimentation. Dr. Huang, welcome to the Launchpad. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Ali Huang, and I'm honored to be a part of this year's Launchpad get my screen sharing here. All right, so today I'm gonna to give you guys an overview of cell-free systems and how they can be used in space applications. For those of you familiar with genes in space, uh, we have a biology toolkit of techniques that students can use to formulate their DNA experiment proposals. Um, in previous years, it was just limited to PCR or polymerase chain reaction to amplify DNA meaning that the proposals were just limited to PCR-based experiments. Uh, but for the first time this year, we've expanded the toolkit to include more tools. So you just heard from Christoph, who already talked about the P51 viewer in his presentation. So today, I'm going to be focused on the BioBits cell-free system. The finalists will be sharing their proposals tomorrow, which may include the uses of BioBits. Um, so today, I'm going to explain uh, what a cell-free system is, how it can be used to produce proteins, and specifically how it can be used to uh, in space to give you uh, some background and context before the finalist presentations tomorrow. So to understand what a cell-free system is and how it can be used to produce proteins, uh, we need to first take a step back and actually talk about what proteins are, just to make sure everyone listening here today is on the same page. So. Proteins are the tools uh, that provide the structure and function uh, for all the cells in your body uh, that keeps you alive and makes you who you are. These include things like proteins that break down the food we eat, uh, proteins that carry oxygen throughout our blood, or uh, proteins that help fight off viruses and infections. The proteins we make in our bodies are really important for keeping us alive, uh, but sometimes scientists want to make proteins outside of the body because they can be really useful tools in a lot of different settings. Uh, for example, when someone has diabetes, it means that their body can't make the protein insulin anymore to help regulate their blood sugar. So as a treatment, they take insulin that has been produced in a lab. If we're thinking about this, you know, in the context of space, what if you have astronauts that have diabetes or some other sort of disease? You know, they're going to need medicines to treat their disease on the ISS, and some of these medicines may be protein-based. Scientists also make certain types of proteins to be used in vaccines to help train our bodies to fight against viruses and other infections. So it would, again, be really useful to be able to make vaccines on the ISS to protect the astronauts in case something uh, outbreaks out there. And as a final example, there are certain types of proteins that can help perform biochemical reactions that will result in biofuels. Not only would this be useful on Earth to find a sustainable fuel source that's better for the environment, but also useful out in space because we will need, <clears throat> excuse me, need a lot of it, a lot of fuel for long distance travel, and it might make more, uh, be more efficient to make the fuel as we go rather than you know, bringing it all with us. So how do proteins get made, whether it's in our bodies or in the lab? Today, I'm not going to go over the exact steps of how this is done, uh, but I did cover this topic in a previous webinar that I did about the central dogma, uh, which you can find on our mini PCR bio YouTube channel. Uh, all you need to know for now is that the instructions for, uh, for your body to make these proteins are found in the genes that make up your DNA. Our DNA contains tens of thousands of genes, each with uh, a gene encoding the instructions uh, for making a specific protein. For example, our DNA contains a gene that encodes insulin and your body will use its information in the insulin gene to make the insulin protein. 
as long as we have the DNA that has the instructions uh, for making all of these different proteins, scientists are, be, are able to make all sorts of proteins in a lab setting. So let's go back to our example where we want to make insulin for diabetes patients. To make the insulin, scientists first take the DNA sequence that encodes for insulin, or again, the insulin gene, and inserts this DNA into cells, um, living cells. This living cells typically are bacteria, although cells from different types of organisms can be used too, and are used as a factory to produce the protein we want. So scientists grow a bunch of these cells in a liquid culture. If you've ever done this in your classroom before, you probably grew cells in a test tube or a beaker, uh, but pharmaceutical companies usually grow these cells in huge tanks. And as these cells grow and divide, they will also take the DNA we gave them, follow the instructions encoded by the DNA and make the insulin. We then harvest or extract the insulin from the cells. And then we have the protein that we can use for our patients. So scientists are pretty good at doing this in a lab or at a company, but it's actually really hard to do this outside of a lab without a ton of resources. You often need to grow these cells in these giant tanks like this setup shown here. And not only is this expensive, but all of this equipment is really heavy and takes up a lot of space. All of this definitely would not fit on the ISS, for example. And knowing how to use all this equipment and grow the cells can also be difficult. Many astronauts don't have the scientific training to be able to make proteins like this. There is an alternative to making live cells as your protein making factory, and that's where cell-free protein synthesis comes in. So how this works is we can take the bacteria, as shown here, uh, that we normally use for protein synthesis and extract all the molecular machinery involved in making proteins from instructions found in the DNA, you then add that extract to some supplemental materials like the biochemical building blocks that make up the proteins and a biological energy source. And all of this can go in a tube. So everything you need to make the protein uh, has now been combined into that little single tube. Since there is nothing living in this tube, there is no need to keep anything alive. So no need for incubators and giant tanks. There's less of a biohazard concern. And all you have to do is add the DNA that encodes the protein you want, and then this reaction will make it. Very easy, very straightforward, and no complex protocols required. So cell-free systems have been around for a while now, and even though you no longer need these giant tanks to grow cells, typically you would still need to keep the reaction super, super cold, like in one of those giant ultra-low temperature freezers, Again, that will make it difficult to keep the reaction cold enough on the ISS. But recently, scientists have found a way to make these reactions more stable so they don't have to be kept super cold. This is a process called freeze drying, and we actually do this to the food being sent up to the astronauts on the ISS. So imagine an astronaut on the ISS really wants an ice cream cone. If you try to stick that ice cream cone in a bag and send it up without keeping it cold, it's gonna go, it's gonna go bad and melt even before it leaves Earth. But what if we could take that ice cream, freeze it solid, and then put it in a special machine called the lyophilizer or freeze dryer. And then what's gonna happen is this machine is gonna suck out all of the water in the ice cream until all you're left with is a solid. Now it won't melt, it won't go bad, and the astronaut can enjoy their freeze dried ice cream on the ISS. We can do the same to these cell-free reactions freeze them solid and suck out all of the water until all we're left with are these little solid pellets like shown here at the bottom of these tubes. When I refer to the BioBits cell-free system, these are the little pellets that I'm talking about. Now they're stable at room temperature and we can more easily ship them up to the ISS without worrying about keeping them cold. And when they get to the ISS, the astronauts won't have to worry about them staying cold until they need to use them to make proteins. So again, once these reactions get to the ISS and they need to be used to make proteins, it's very straightforward to do. Uh, for example, going back to our previous example, uh, say we need insulin for an astronaut with diabetes. Again, the freeze-dried cell-free pellet contains all of the machinery and material to build the protein, but you still need to add the instructions for making the insulin. We do so by adding DNA that contains the insulin gene, with those instructions. Once the reaction is hydrated from its freeze-dried state, 
The components inside will take the information found in the insulin gene and use it to build uh, the insulin protein. From there, we can recover the produced insulin from the reaction for use. By including this freeze-dried cell-free system of BioBits in this year's Genes in Space Toolkit, we were posing a question to all the students. What protein do you want to make in space? And again, the BioBit system in the toolkit this year is just one example of a freeze-dried cell-free system. Um, like Katie mentioned, I developed BioBits in grad school specifically for educational uses. That is allowing students to make their own proteins using the BioBits cell-free system without needing any fancy equipment or complicated protocols, making it more accessible to more schools especially those that you know, don't have many resources for science equipment. BioBits can be used to demonstrate a variety of molecular biology concepts. For example, students are able to make fluorescent proteins and use this brightly visual output. Here it's being visualized in the P51 viewer, again, one of our other genes in space toolkits, or students can actually use their knowledge of DNA and proteins that they've learned to create their own designs made up of many different fluorescent proteins as shown here. These fluorescent outputs can be used in the hand uh, in hands-on activities to understand things like central dogma, transcription, translation, structure and function of proteins, and more. So far, BioBits has had great success in the classroom and other educational settings to make molecular biology more accessible and engaging. Beyond educational applications, there are also many great examples of how cell-free protein synthesis can be applied. For example, water quality testing was in the news in the last few years recently because of the lead contamination in Flint, Michigan. There are lots of potential contaminants in our drinking water from metals to drugs like antibiotics. A cell-free reaction assay works well for water quality testing in the field. Scientists have actually designed a system where you add a water sample to a cell-free reaction and a specific uh, a clear color change indicates the presence of a specific contaminant. Uh, let's zoom in to see how this works. The cell-free reaction contains a sensor that activates the transcription of a reporter gene only in the presence of a contaminant. So if that specific contaminant is present, the reporter gene is transcribed and then translated. The trick is that the reporter gene encodes an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of a colorist substrate into a colored product. So we zoom in on the yellow tube, we see that the reporter enzyme leads to the production of a yellow color, which indirectly tells us that this uh, contaminant was present in the sample being tested. You can also design uh, a biosensor within the cell-free system to detect and screen for pathogens. Um, a paper that I was part of recently uh, came out describing how you can use cell-free systems with these biosensors and actually freeze dry them onto fabrics instead of a pellet and make wearable diagnostics. As shown here, the sleeve on this prototype shirt here has cell-free reactions freeze dried onto it with biosensors. If the target molecule is sensed some sort of visual output like a fluorescence or a luminescent protein signal is released and detected. For example, imagine a face mask that has a cell-free biosensor freeze-dried onto it that could detect the coronavirus. That's obviously a very current example, but a setup like this could be expanded. You know, a doctor's lab coat to detect common hospital superbugs, a soldier's uniform to detect biological warfare agents, or again, in the context of space, an astronaut's clothing to detect any potential airborne pathogens or contaminants floating around the ISS. I just wanted to end and say that all of these examples that I've shown and talked about so far are only mere prototypes and ideas at this stage. Lots more will have to be done to turn them into functional applications, but that's why it's so exciting to have BioBits as part of the Genes in Space Toolkit. The ideas and proposals that these students are coming up with that we're gonna hear about tomorrow could very well be translated into the next big application for space biology. And the students, both past like I'm showing here in the pictures, and present and future are right at the start of this really exciting new era of space biology. Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk and I'll turn it back over to Katie now.
Thank you so much, Allie, for unpacking BioBits for us. And thanks for sharing this technology. We're super excited to help you launch it soon. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Chris Carr. Dr. Carr is a professor at uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he works at the Daniel Guggenheim School of Aerospace Engineering and the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. He's a researcher and engineer operating within the field of astrobiology, which is a really exciting subfield under the space biology umbrella. Astrobiologists think about what the origins of life look like all throughout the universe uh, and hypothesize what extraterrestrial life could look like if it does exist. They also help develop tools to aid in the detection of extraterrestrial life, uh, which is what Dr. Carr is going to be sharing with us today. Now, when you think about a professor, you might picture someone lecturing from behind a podium, but that is not the kind of professor Dr. Carr is. He is as much an adventurer as he is an academic. Um, this photo is from a trip he took to Devon Island in Nunavut, Canada, which is way up in the Arctic Circle. He is standing inside a meteorite impact crater and he's holding a shatter cone, which is a rock formation that's produced by meteorite impacts. Uh, here he is briefly experiencing microgravity uh, on a zero-g corporation research flight where he and his team tested a single molecule detector. Now, when we saw those photos, um, we knew that Dr. Carr had the right kind of pioneering spirit to help us kick off uh, our finalist launch pad, the centerpiece of our 2021 competition. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Carr to the launch pad. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, so I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Uh, my group at Georgia Tech focuses on single molecule detection for and space instrument development for astrobiology and space biology. And today I hope to tell you, uh, I'm gonna tell you a story about our past and how, what that might mean for our future in space. So before we get started, I always feel as, uh, as a scientist, uh, it's good to be clear about your biases. And so my bias is that I'm obsessed with space exploration. So uh, the moment I knew that was actually when the space shuttle Challenger exploded and I knew that I still wanted to go. And in high school, I worked enough to fund some flying lessons and get my pilot's license. I went on to do some amateur mountaineering. Uh, in college, I designed and built solar electric vehicles, uh, learned to scuba dive and paraglide, and really was focusing on pushing humans to the limit. What, was my, what were my own limits? And then I had a chance to work on spacesuit design and astronaut performance with Dava Newman and as I finished my PhD, a fantastic opportunity came up to work with Maria Zuber and Gary Rovkin on life detection. And I've been doing that for 15 years now, and it's been a fantastic adventure. So let's talk about what we know for sure. We know that life got started now at least once. And when you think of life, you might think of people or trees or animals or whatever. But when I think of life, when a molecular biologist thinks of life or an astrobiologist, we're thinking about single cell organisms. That's probably the most common type of life in the universe. So what are the components of this life? Um, there's three main types of molecules that make up this organism. One are the metabolic uh, uh, components. And these are, this is like proteins, the machinery of life. A second category of molecule would be informational. This would be the DNA or RNA that provides the basis for heredity and evolution in, in all known life. And a third category would be compartment forming molecules like lipids that help to protect, compartmentalize, and make life a modular. So one of the key questions in the origin of life field is which one of these things came first. And there's a number of different theories of the origin of life, but the one that I think really does the best job is called the cyanosulfitic origin of life. Now, the reason I like it is because it neatly sidesteps that question, as I'll tell you in a moment. 
So it involves a planetary surface environment with uh, volcanic gases producing hydrogen cyanide. And this hydrogen cyanide can undergo a series of chemical reactions uh, with uh, catalyzed by ultraviolet light. And it turns out that these reactions can give rise to all the building blocks for all those things we just talked about, the metabolic informational and compartment forming molecules of life. And this provides the basis for the first cells to evolve and become in this, these protocells would have been uh, some of the very earliest life, uh, probably an RNA protein world. And it would have all those key functions and then be able to undergo evolution and generate all the diversity of life that we observe today. Now, this model puts some constraints on the kind of environment where this might happen. So key thoughts here would be, this would occur in a surface environment. It would require wet, dry cycles. It would require shallow, a shallow water environment and geologic time for these organic materials to build up. So now let's think about, do we have any evidence for this in present day life? So if we look at that, we can see that there are actually molecular fossils within all known life. And these are um, epitomized here by the ribosome, which is a structure that is central to the central dogma, which as we heard before is, DNA gets, caught, gets transcribed to RNA, and that is translated uh, to protein. So we just heard about this fantastic tool, BioBits, and really at the core of that are these ribosomes doing this translation. So this is really, um, we know this is a molecular fossil because we can look at the ribosome itself is made of RNA and protein, and it was built up over time at certain regions of the ribosomal sequences are essentially identical, unchanged over billions of years, whereas other regions vary more quickly. And this is kind of like having a watch that has not just the year, the day, you know, the month, the day, but also the hour, minute, and second hand. So it's like a clock. So we can take all of these ribosomal sequences and we can use them to construct a tree by comparing how similar or different they are. In fact, we can do this with whole genomes so we can get very precise uh, resolution on this tree of life. And if we do this, we can see that all known life shares a common ancestor, which we call the last universal common ancestor or LUCA. And it turns out LUCA was a very complex organism and had a complete genetic code. It itself was very distant from the origin of life. So here we can see the three main uh, domains of life, the bacteria and archaea and the eukaryota. Now we're out here on the animals branch of the eukaryota near our friends, the fungi, the plants, and our cousins, the slime molds. And if we go and think about, uh, we can combine this information with uh, fossil evidence and with uh, time calibration, and that can allow us to put constraints on when these splits in the tree occurred. And this has been done and used to show that the archaea themselves are in the order of 4 billion years old, which means LUCA is even older. So as you can tell, life must be extremely old. Now, as a logical consequence, each one of us is a product of this unbroken chain stretching back billions of years. I think that is amazing. Okay, so how does this, what was the earth like at this time? If we think about, um, if we look at a timeline of our 4.6 billion year history on Earth, we can see humans are really just this tiny line the last couple million years. Early on in Earth's history, Earth was bombarded uh, by meteorites in the Hadean. And it's only by about 3.5 billion years ago that we have definitive fossil evidence of life. Although there's some more circumstantial evidence a bit earlier. So what was Earth like during this time? Well, it turns out early Earth was an ocean world. Before about 3.5 billion years ago, the only land would have been volcanic island hotspots similar to the Hawaiian Islands. This is one reason why we don't have a lot of rocks from this time. Now you remember that 
that model we talked about the cyanosulfitic uh, origin of life. And it turns out this was not such a good environment for that model. It doesn't have that surface environment or it's very limited. Uh, it's harder to generate wet dry cycles on an ocean world and the water is not so shallow. So how can we resolve this contradiction? Well, it turns out there's another option that might have been better for life. Early Mars had plenty of land area, but also more water, not too much, not too little. And we can even see today in this image from the Curiosity rover, evidence of chemical energy in the form of iron minerals. And there's other sources as well. So we know early Mars was habitable. It had conditions that were much more favorable to the cyanosulfitic origin of life. And it's relatively cold and arid, uh, more arid environment could allow organics to accumulate over time. So, okay, you might be saying, okay, I buy, I buy the idea that, you know, life could have started on early Mars. I mean, NASA's looking for life there. So that makes sense. But how could life get to earth? Well, it turns out all the steps in this process have been verified through experiment or modeling. And this, what this process is, is a large meteorite impact could knock material off of one planet and have it end up on another world. And in this way, um, a billion tons of rock habitable for life has been transported from Mars to Earth. So let's think about that for a second. A meteorite slams into Mars, it knocks off material, a fraction of it doesn't get heated above sterilization temperatures, it spends years to centuries or longer in deep space in a deep freeze. That's how we preserve microbes. And then it ends up at earth and it enters the atmosphere. And you might be thinking, well, that sounds kind of, uh, you know, things burn up in the atmosphere, but take a look at this meteorite. We can see there's the scorched outer shell, but then the center of it is still at deep space temperatures because it uh, plows through the atmosphere in only a few seconds. In fact, if you were to go find a fresh meteorite, you actually might see it forming frost on the surface because of those deep space temperatures soaking outward. Now, in this way, as I mentioned, about a billion tons of rock has come, gone from Mars to Earth. And this is 99% of the exchange between Earth and Mars has been from Mars to Earth. Okay, so now how are we gonna find this life on Mars? We've got some fantastic vehicles on Mars looking for life right now. Uh, the Curiosity rover is in Gale Crater. And here we have the Perseverance rover now in Jezero Crater. Jezero is a really fascinating environment. It used to be a lake. And in addition, it's a watershed. The region of Mars that fed this lake is, covers a wide range of areas in about the age of 4 billion years old. And it will, it will allow us to sample a wide range of different environments on Mars just without going out of the crater. And of course, now we have this fantastic a helper vehicle, Ingenuity, which has now done 10 flights. So how are we gonna, there's a problem here though, which is jet, we might find evidence of ancient life on Mars, but how would we determine if it's related to us? So to answer that question, we have been developing a space instrument called the Search for Extraterrestrial Genomes. It integrates nucleic acid detection via nanopore sequencing embedded within our instrument, and it will help us uh, detect life as we know it. Of course, we don't wanna make that assumption everywhere. So we're also building other instruments, including this ELI instrument you see on the right, that can target life without making assumptions about whether it's related to us or not. Okay, so we wanna get this to Mars. So we've, we've sequenced on Mars, quote unquote, in the lab under Mars temperature and pressure. We've also taken this technology on parabolic flights and shown that it's extremely robust to vibration and different G levels. And this means the practical significance means you can do nanopore sequencing basically anywhere, static and dynamic environments on platforms like cars, ships, and drones. So uh, this is very important. 
Uh, we've also taken sequencing uh, and instrument technologies into the field. Here, we were uh, studying microbes living in acid hot springs on the side of an active volcano with similar uh, chemistry and mineralogy to regions on Mars. Uh, we also have been studying a unique set of lakes in interior British Columbia. So it turns out early Mars, uh, there were sulfate lakes, sulfate salt lakes, and we see that today through sulfate deposits on the Martian surface. And unlike the sodium chloride salts that dominate the ocean, sodium, uh, sulfate lakes have uh, very different properties. And so we were studying these lakes to understand how do microbes adapt to those environments? And also, how do these environments preserve biosignatures that we could detect on Mars? And some of these lakes have very interesting spotted appearances and are hypersaline. Uh, we're also studying microbes in some of the driest places on Earth. This photo from our collaborator in the Atacama Desert is probably the driest or one of the driest places on Earth. And there, the, uh, the relative humidity is so low, it's similar to Mars. Now we have a problem. The, on, we wanna look for DNA in order to be able to detect whether life on Mars is related to us, but DNA will not survive for billions of years. We need to find life that's alive today. And this means we have a problem. The current surf the surface of Mars is too cold and too dry for life as we know it. And it's been this way for billions of years. So how are we going to look for life on Mars that's a lot that might be alive today? So one option is to go, NASA has pursued a follow the water strategy. And so one option is to go where there's liquid water. And on Mars today, this means going deep or finding spots that are sort of closer to the surface where we might access uh, a local heat source where that could produce liquid water. So here's one option. It's a glacier on Mars. It appears to have water at the base due to the flow that's occurring. And the problem is in order to do that, we might need to send humans, which means we need to send a lot of mass. So we don't exactly have a great option yet, for putting humans on the surface of Mars, but in development is the SpaceX Starship and rockets like this that can carry 100 tons of payload or that are projected to would be a great candidate. So could we really do this? To answer that question, we should consider that this has already been done on Earth. So what does it take to drill into the subsurface on planet Earth? Here's an example from Antarctica drilling down to a subglacial lake about 800 meters. Now, as you can see, this is a lot of equipment on the ice. It turns out it's a million pounds. This is about four to five Starship landings on Mars. So it's a lot, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. If we wanna do this, we can do it. Now, here's the end game. If we find life on Mars, there's a good chance it's related to us and that we may be Martian. So maybe we'll be going, returning home. Now, of course, as a scientist, I would be remiss if I didn't say we could be wrong. We're making some assumptions. And so the good news is, even if we are not Martians, we will be. And that means we're gonna have to learn to live and work in space. Now, here's one of the challenges. We've got a lot of microbes in our bodies, in our gut and elsewhere, and where humans go, microbes will go. This means we'll be bringing with us fungi, bacteria, parasites, et cetera. And we need better ways to detect and characterize them and maybe also use them for useful purposes like in situ resource extraction. So we're working recently, we've been sequencing microbes from the International Space Station, focusing on enterococcus, which is an organism that's the second leading cause of hospital acquired infection. So one of the studies that we're doing is called genomic enumeration of antibiotic resistance in space. Astronauts will sample different locations on the space station, will culture them with antibiotic on antibiotic media, and we will identify and survey the range of microbes on the space station that could potentially be a risk to crew members. And this work is being done in collaboration with Sarah Wallace and Aaron Burton 
uh, who have, uh, as you may have heard from last year, Sarah Wallace talked at this event. And um, this is really fantastic and will give us some insight into whether these microbes might pose a risk uh, for astronauts in space. Now, I hope you're as excited as I am about all the different potential ways that we can apply biology at the intersection of biology and aerospace, not just astrobiology, not just planetary protection, not just human health, but those in, that in situ resource utilization you heard earlier today about producing medicines. There's just a, a, so many ways that you can have an impact uh, in, for our shared biological future in space. I personally can't wait to see what you come up with. Thank you so much to Genes in Space, to the members of my lab, and to all the Genes in Space competitors and supporters. Thank you. Dr. Carr, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a little bit about astrobiology with the folks at home. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. So with that, I'd like to close out our kickoff program, uh, but I hope that you'll join us back here tomorrow uh, as we write the next chapter for Genes in Space and select the winner of our 2021 competition. The main event will be happening tomorrow, same time, same place, 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, our finalist presentations. So our five finalist teams will be presenting their ideas to our panel of judges for a chance to launch their work to the ISS in 2022. Uh, on Thursday, July 29th, same time, 1 p.m. here on YouTube, we're going to be announcing the winner of this year's competition, so be sure to tune in for that. Um, we're also going to be conferring our 2021 John Hatch Memorial Prize in Mentorship. As I mentioned earlier, mentors are a really key part of our program, and through the Hatch Prize, we recognize all the amazing mentors who have left an impact on our work in the past. So it's all happening this week week here at the Launchpad, please come back and do join us for the rest of the Launchpad program. I'd like to close today by thanking our sponsors who make this exciting work possible, uh, our founding partners, Mini PCR Bio and Boeing, as well as our sponsors, New England Bio Labs and the Space Station Explorers Program from the ISS US National Lab. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, I hope to see you back here tomorrow for the finalist presentations. Till then. <laughs>